you come back! So I always love to start from the beginning. Your characters, Henry and Bonnie, are integral for Maya's journey. What attracted you to the roles initially? Chaske. What attracted me was uh, Marvel and the story. When Sydney pitched the idea of where she was going to go with this, I was game. I was full on game. Um, I love working and it being challenged as an actor, and this just went right up my alley. And plus, working with, a, with my fellow indigenous thespians, it's, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very comforting and uh, it's fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And how about for you, Debbie? When I first got the casting breakdown for Echo, I had known of the character, I had seen Hawkeye, I was a huge fan of Alakwa Cox and everything she did with the role of Maya Lopez in that. Uh, and getting to read for, at the time the character's name was Julie because it was like a super top secret, everything was under lock and key, so they had fictitious sides and, and I didn't have a chance to, to read the script because everything was top secret. And um, I I knew it was a Marvel project, but re what really drew me to it was the fact that Sydney Freeland was at the helm, who's a, a trans and Navajo uh, filmmaker who I've had the chance to work with before, who is a rock star. And even though she's really calm, her voice is really direct and clear. Uh, so I knew it was gonna be an incredible project. And I went through the whole casting process, <laughs> the extensive auditions and callbacks and chemistry tests and, and all of it, but um, knowing Sydney was was in the eye of the storm was the the reason I signed on. For sure, and one of my favorite attributes of the show is the focus on American Sign Language, which was, was this the most you guys had used signing on a project, and what was that experience like on set? It was, you know, at the beginning it was a very challenge. Oh, I, I never had, um, this is the first time I ever used ASL in a, in a film, and um, uh, at first, it was a bit challenging, but then, you know, after a while, Doug Redoff and um, Alakwa Cox just made us feel really comfortable. And you want to you want to do such a good job to make it authentic, and uh, to make uh, to make it work so the audience can see that and they can relate to it. Definitely. I have always wanted to learn ASL. I love learning languages, but I had never taken it upon myself to to learn ASL until Echo. Um, they set us up with different deaf interpreters and also uh, trainers and, and learning all of the lines with Douglas Ridloff's help, who's a, a producer as well as the ASL master of the project. And I thought it was I thought it was really special. It was it was definitely a challenge, but one that we were up to the task for and um, yeah, to be able to to have signing scenes with Alaco was was super special, and I'm really proud of that. Absolutely, and you know, with a show like this, there's so much diversity. There's so many different elements and aspects of you guys as a community that you get to show, but also as the individual characters. What is something that you took away from the roles of Bonnie and Henry that you know you guys kind of implemented into your real life? What aspects did you really take away from those characters, Debbie? Do you want to go first? I'm still thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I think what I took away was uh, you'll be very lucky and fortunate to be able to uh, to visit the world of ASL and to be privileged to be uh, in the company of, of that uh, with Alakwa and uh, taking away well, after after production end. I was very grateful that I had that experience because you know what I love about my job is I get to get into situations and. Uh, have experiences that I probably normally wouldn't have. And I love that I can learn th throughout my job. Yeah, same. <laughs> I'm still learning ASL uh, after Echo. And um, it's something that I want to continue to do. I'm definitely a student, uh, but I thought it was it was an incredible opportunity to not only welcome us into this world and to be able to communicate with the deaf community, but for hopefully to inspire other people to do it as well. Absolutely. Well, the show looks absolutely fantastic. There's so much that goes on, and you guys are an integral part of the story, and you bring so much to the characters. Thank you so much for your time, and congratulations on Echo. Oh, thank, thank you. you. The way this show is shot and edited with things like the one take fight sequence, you know, the color grading and things like that gives the show a very unique feel among the catalog of MCU shows. How did you guys kind of decide on the aesthetic for the show? What went into that process? Thank you. There, that was a lot of long conversations with our director and executive producer, Sydney Freeland, and her team of uh, her longstanding director of photography that she works with, Kira Kelly, and her editor, Shelby Hall. Together, uh, 
they came up with everything you just mentioned, the aesthetic for the show, the look, the feel, the idea that, you know, Oklahoma and the sequences that take place in the present day Oklahoma are a little bit different looking than the flashbacks to New York. You know, it was so thought out. That was one of the first things Sydney spoke about, actually, when she came to the project was talking about how she was going to portray New York on screen versus Oklahoma and how it was going to evolve over the course of the show. Uh, so that's awesome that you picked up on that because that's something that Sydney and Kira and Shelby put a lot of thought into. Absolutely. And there's a there's a huge diversity of ethnicities, backgrounds, and abilities, you know, throughout this show, including the use of American Sign Language, which I think is like such a cool thing that it's getting this representation right now. You know, so why was it important to showcase that at this point in time for viewers, but also for the MCU, in your opinion, as the producer? Yeah, Maya Lopez is a character from the comics that we couldn't wait to introduce, and she's she's relatively more obscure in the comics, but she is deaf in the comics, she is native in the comics, and uh, when we were planning on bringing her to screen, it wasn't just the violence and the tone that we wanted to make sure we got right and needed to honor for the fans of this character, but we definitely wanted to not shy away from the fact that she is deaf and she is native. So we, we made sure uh, with our team of writers that we got very specific about her background and we made her Choctaw um, after a long conversations. And then as far as her deafness and the use of sign language on the show, one of our producers, Doug Ridloff, is deaf and he worked very hard with our actors to make sure that every character had their own way of signing. Uh, it was really awesome to watch, but it's one of the most unique parts of the show and something that, you know, you pick up on details that each one of the actors, um, when they sign differently from each other, it, it really brings an emotionality to each one of those characters that, you know, otherwise could have been taken for granted. So Doug and our actors are really... They went the extra mile in terms of the ASL, but each character, I think you learn a little bit about them just in their level of proficiency in signing and the way that they sign, the way they are trying to communicate with Maya. Like, they each have their own little history and backstory, and it's really it's really a cool detail, uh, thanks to Doug Ridloff. Absolutely. And, you know, you've seen the show from the inception to the completion at this point, so what was your proudest moment in overseeing the production of the show? There is a sequence in our finale that is, uh, takes place at a powwow. And that was something that during production, we were all like, that was our big, you know, uh, the thing we were running towards was the powwow, the powwow, and making sure that we were bringing a real powwow to screen authentically and doing something really impressive and something that I don't think has been seen before on the scale that we've done it. So that was for me the thing that was the biggest undertaking, but the thing that I'm most proud of when I watch this show. When you when you tune into the finale and see our powwow, it's really breathtaking, and I really hope that fans are happy about it. Absolutely. And what is your, you know, kind of biggest takeaway for viewers? What would you like them to walk away from the series in mind with? I hope that people show up for the violence and the action and the, the badass tone that we've shown in our trailers, but really, uh, by the end of the show have a very emotional time and can reflect on, you know, their lives and their families. It's, a, it's actually a family drama wrapped up in all this violence at the end of the day, which is the heart of the character of Echo, you know, and her relationship with Vincent D'Onofrio. Uh, it's the duality of violence versus love and coming out of a show that is action-packed and really kick-ass, I really hope that fans take away, wow, that was, that was a really emotional show as well. Absolutely, and I always kind of like to ask this question. Uh, if you could have Maya take on any other character from the MCU as of now, just kind of like in a dream match. <laughs> who would you pair her against and why? My and dream who, that fight? <laughs> my dream, and it is truly just a dream and only in my brain and nothing uh, on a wall anywhere at Marvel, but my dream would be to see Maya interact with with a cosmic character. Uh, and then we can get some Choctaws in space. Because that that's my dream for us. That's my dream for the Choctaw. I love that because that that would be that would be pretty fun. We could that could be maybe somewhere in the what if catalog. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. But thank you so much for your time. Echo is a fantastic show. You guys did an outstanding job, and the representation that is on screen is truly breathtaking. So thank you so much, and congratulations on all the success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi Eli. So I always like to start off at the beginning because you guys start the series off with a bang. And one of my favorite elements are the long one take fight scenes, very reminiscent of Asian cinema like Old Boy, The Protector, and of course, Netflix's Daredevil. Uh, what was the process of directing some of those scenes? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, in the first episode, we've got a great uh, fight sequence that is uh, that is a, a one -er. 
and you know it, it and we looked we did look at a lot of different uh, sort of uh, films and, and shows for for inspiration but I think it all comes down to story and it all comes down to the script right and so for myself what what I really loved about um, on the page was this idea of the character of, of Maya Lopez uh, um, we sort of began became uh, we began calling this scene the birth of a villain right and so uh, in the scene, Maya Lopez comes in as a teenage girl, but she leaves it as a cold-blooded killer. And so for myself, it was important to, that I really wanted the audience to see that transformation happen in real time. Uh, and so uh, that lent itself to us shooting as a one -er and in talking with my stunt coordinator, Mark Skizak, you know, we, we knew it was ambitious because we didn't have the luxury of a feature film uh, schedule to have weeks or months of, of practice and rehearsal and, and choreography. Um, we had, you know, I think we had a couple weeks. And so we knew, we knew, we knew it was a big swing, but we, it was one we wanted to take because it just, it told the story in such an amazing way. And it turned out very, very well. And of course, we have to talk about, you know, the culture of things, because as a Navajo filmmaker yourself, this show brings the community into a really diverse and high profile spotlight as action heroes, villains, people with superpowers, and it brings a really holistic look at the community and as the people. So what was the most important aspect of that that you really wanted to showcase as a director? Yeah, you know, I, I think you sort of uh, hit the nail on the head, right? So I'm Navajo, but the tribe that we were portraying in, in the show is the Choctaw Nation. And, and those two those two cultures are, are vastly different from each other, completely different languages, completely different cultures, completely different heritages. So for myself, it was important for us to uh, uh, meet with the Choctaw Nation and do two things. One was ask their permission. You know, which sadly is something that is not a uh, 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 commonplace when you know people are portraying Native Americans on film. Um, we want to ask for permission, but we also wanted to create a dialogue. You know, um, uh, create a conversation because we're playing, we're portraying a Choctaw culture. We wanted to uh, you know get their input on uh, everything from their culture to their language to their you know traditions and you know. We wanted to push the envelope with what we were doing narratively, but we also wanted to define what the envelope was, you know, and that meant, you know, being respectful of certain cultural taboos, um, uh, so on and so forth. And then, but they were just absolutely amazing partners to work with, and we're so happy with the final product. For sure. And that actually really lends itself to my next question I was going to ask, which was, how did you kind of decide on the parts of the show to incorporate and to branch out on your own look? Because you kind of have the unique position of bridging together, you know, the Daredevil mythology from the Netflix series as well as kind of creating your own. So how did you figure out and settle on the parts that you wanted to keep and how did you decide on the parts that you wanted to make completely your own? Oh yeah, you know, it, I would say that that sort of came that came about organically, right? Um, we we always knew that we were going to explore this uh, Maya Lopez return home to Oklahoma and and for the MCU it's it's a sort of a it's a previously sort of unexplored uh, uh, corner uh, of, of the universe that we we're able to go to and but we at the same time we also wanted to just firmly establish that Maya Lopez was a character in the MCU and and so I think once we had done that and we were able to make that departure, then the sort of the it was kind of a blank canvas in the best possible way, um, in that we could we could tell the story of Maya Lopez going home in, in so many different ways. But then once the Choctaw uh, um, uh, Nation became incorporated, um, what we what we got one of the great things we learned is that we got to hear uh, about their history and their culture uh, from their perspective. You know, uh, this wasn't some like archaeological text or, or, or something that we were referencing. And so one of the great things that came from that is actually in the second episode, we visit a, uh, without spoiling the show, we visit a, <clears throat> uh, a section of the United States uh, pre-European contact um, in, in uh, 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 without spoiling it, it's, it's, a, it's an event that I think a lot of uh, even indigenous uh, Americans aren't even aware existed. Um, and that came as a direct collaboration with our uh, Choctaw, uh, with the Choctaw Nation. Absolutely. Well, I could sit here and talk about this for hours because there's so much great content and great culture that you guys have incorporated into the series. But for now, I just want to congratulate you and the entire team on Echo. It's such a beautiful series. And thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thanks so much.